Hello, welcome to Encore. Coming up. American star Jennifer Lawrence speaks to France 24 about the Hunger Games grand finale. Paris's Rodin Museum reopens after a three-year revamp. And it's even got a giant chocolate tribute to France's most famous sculptor. And from Beirut to Benghazi, contemporary photography from the Arab world is being celebrated in the French capital. Thanks for joining us. Hunger Games star Jennifer Lawrence has been speaking to France 24 about how much she's going to miss her much-loved character Katniss Everdeen. The actress has been in Paris this week for the premiere of Mockingjay Part 2, the fourth and final film in the series. France 24's Louise Dupont went to meet the cast and the fans on the red carpet. It's the last film. It's fantastic. Josh Hutchison is my idol. <laughs> the wait is over. The Hunger Games finale has arrived. This fourth film, Mockingjay Part 2, is Jennifer Lawrence's last outing as Katniss Everdeen, a heroine loved by millions. How do you feel now this whole Hunger Games experience is coming to an end? It's really crazy. I don't even, you know, when we, when we wrapped up shooting, I was so sad. Um, but after seeing the movie, it's just exciting. We feel so good about it, so we're excited for the fans to see it. What will you miss about being Katniss Sabanin? Everything. I, I will miss that character because she's so incredible. Um, and I'll also miss just growing up with a character. Uh, and I'll miss seeing Josh and Liam all day, every day. The epic global phenomenon of the Hunger Games well, ends with a powerful the final the chapter, including the long battle between Katniss and President Snow. I cried. It was amazing. Amazing. Francis Lawrence is a god. Uh, what's so special about this last episode? Well, it's the end. I mean, that's one of the big special things about it. Uh, I think it's probably one of the most uh, epic and emotional of the series. Um, but, you know, each of the films so far has ended with a cliffhanger, with the promise of more. And this one is the conclusion. So we see the history of the characters and the relationships and all the dynamics and all the storylines coming to a very dramatic conclusion. Uh, really excited for fans to see it. What was life like in, on the set? Uh, well, it was a mix because it was, you know, it was a hard shoot. These are complicated movies to make, so there was a lot of hard work, and some of it was strenuous, and some of it was very tiring. But it's an amazing group of people, uh, and they're very lighthearted and very fun and very funny. So there was always a great balance of, of hard work and a lot of fun. Uh, you know, these, these guys all like to play. Can you sum up your Hunger Games experience in three words? Wow. Hunger Games experience in three words. Uh, Satisfying, gratifying, and friendships. The fans will no doubt miss the saga. As you can see behind me, they've enjoyed this last and fourth episode. Our attacks, President Snow is building a minefield of traps. The sadistic inventions of game makers meant to make sport of our deaths. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 76th Hunger Games. Now she was schooled by Marcel Duchamp, gave Lucien Freud his first London show and discovered Jackson Pollock. Now a new documentary, Peggy Guggenheim, Art Addict, tells the story of one of the 20th century's most important art collectors. Peggy Guggenheim gathered many of her works in Paris in 1940 as the Nazis were laying siege on Europe. The film's director, Lisa imordino Vreeland, says her role in art history is staggering. I felt that she really wasn't understood, and her role in art history was something that was too tempered because people really didn't understand what her accomplishments were. Because her other side was really the side that we know much more, the sexual side, her exploits. And those exploits make up her fantastic character. But, if, you know, her, the fact that she, this whole sense of transformation and reinvention is something that attracts me very, very much in characters. And that's what she did. She totally reinvented herself and left us an amazing legacy.
Next, it was a ruin when he lived there, then nearly ruined by millions of trampling tourists after his death. Now, the Musée Rodin, dedicated to the French sculpture, has been vamped up over three years to the tune of 16 million euros. For the reopening this week, the chocolate maker, Patrick Roger, has created a Rodinesque sculpture that will remain in place until February. The towering sculpture looks and smells like chocolate, but the disappointment of visitors is labelled non-edible. Catherine Norris-Trent went along to the refurbished museum to take a look. Twenty-three sculptures have been restored for the reopening of the Rodin Museum here in Paris, including this world-famous work, The Kiss. It took two restorers two full days of work to remove all the dust and to give the white marble back its famous glean. And the curators of the Rodin Museum have also been digging down in the cellars and they've got out some of the plaster and terracotta models the sculptor used to generate some of his iconic works. They've been displayed to the public for the first time. We often don't have a complete vision of Rodin. People know his bronze and marble sculptures, but not as much about his experimental work, how he produced his final sculptures. The idea here is to show the visitors Rodin's thought process. The renovation has taken three years at a cost of 16 million euros. The museum has been reorganized to give visitors a better idea of how Rodin lived and worked. This room, for example, was one of the sculptor's studios and it's been restored now to be as authentic as possible with some of the artist's own furniture and private sculpture collection in place. We had very detailed, old photographs of this room, and that allowed us to recreate the studio almost exactly as it was. It's almost as though Rodin was here to welcome us. There are also around 50 paintings from Rodin's private collection, which are on display here in the museum, including works by Vincent van Gogh, Claude Monet, and Edvard Munch, among others. From Beirut to Benghazi, via Morocco, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, contemporary photography from the Arab world is being celebrated at a new Biennale in Paris. It's an opportunity to showcase diverse artistic talents united by a shared language and culture and to shed a new light on the region, often characterised by conflict. Olivia Salazar-Winspear went to the Arab World Institute. Let's take a look. Writing with sunlight, the word photography may have its roots in the Greek language, but in the Arab world, light and shade have long been part of architecture and art. The Arab World Institute's now put that practice in the spotlight with this first edition of the Biennale of Contemporary Arab Photography. New views of and from places like Saudi Arabia. Amy Cat ushers us into the crumbling walls of a traditional house in Hijaz. The purpose of this particular size is for you to live that space one more time. And so if you stand in front of it at its optimum diagonal viewing point, which is three times the diagonal line, and walk towards it, you enter that space. And that's the feeling we want to establish. It's a visual invitation to look beyond the cliches of this strict Wahhabi society and contemplate its cultural heritage. Back in um, 19... 92, I tried taking a picture on a corniche and I was stopped by three policemen. Uh, but today, I tried to take a picture on the same spot in the corniche with my family and uh, the coast yard, coastal, uh, sorry, the coastal uh, police uh, offered me a ride in the boat to get closer to the fountain. So I thought, well, that's a beautiful contrast. So things are getting better. French photographer Amélie Debray brought an outsider's perspective when she took her camera to the Palestinian territories. There she found that a love of the beautiful game transcended all sorts of borders. This photo was taken in Jericho. She's part of an all-girl team who train together in the evenings. I found it surprising that they were so passionate about sport. Their football brings people together in a country where things are very fragmented. Everything is complicated. When you have to go through a checkpoint to get to somebody else's playing field, it's a pain. But once you're playing, you want to see your team win. It's the feeling of being part of a nation in a place where officially that doesn't exist. 
Glances of daily life in a region which struggles to shake off associations with conflict and religious tensions. Yet the circumstances do produce creative sparks, prompting contemporary expressions of this reality. Steve Sabella makes images that resemble precious artefacts. His shows called 38 Days of Recollection, the time he spent living in a Palestinian house now occupied by Israelis. And I became like a visual investigator, became obsessed. I photographed everything I could see in the house, you know, from the bathroom to the cupboards to the kitchen. What we're looking at here is the transformation of digital images into a one-time original, proving that all debates on digital photography are nonsense. 50 years from now, 100, what would people remember? I guarantee that to you, they will remember less the politics and the context, and what remains is the image. Despite the diversity of the work on show, there are notable absences. With fewer women than men presenting their photos, this Biennale not only provides fresh glimpses of an evolving Middle East, it also leaves us wanting more from the next generation of photographers. Now we're going to leave you with images from a charity art exhibition and sale that's taking place in Paris, the Louis Vuitton Foundation. 200 artists, some famous and some unknown, have produced a work of art. They've signed it on the back so people will only know what they've got once they've bought it. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter and Facebook. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this.